It's no secret that I am a big fan of the Serious Sam games. Ever since I played the demo for the next encounter on PS2, and then afterwards bought the Xbox port of the first and second encounters, I've been playing these games and their various sequels, re-releases, remasters, and community-made mod expansions ever since. Then Serious Sam 2 came along, which took the series into hyper-bonkers Saturday morning cartoon Overdrive, and remains to this day to be the most divisive title amongst the fan community. Heck, even the description for the game's thread in the official Croteen Discord reflects this. You either love it, or you hate it. Yeah, never a truer word spoken, I can tell you that much. Then a whole six years later, Crow Team gave us Serious Sam 3, before First Encounter, a prequel to the first encounter which ditched the more stupid and silly aspects of the series to give us a more realistic and grittier tone, akin to more modern shooters like Call of Duty. Whilst this game was certainly fun and it brought a lot of the classic formula back, in many ways it felt to me like too much of an overcorrection from Sam 2. Now nine years later, Crow Team is back with another prequel, Serious Sam 4, formerly known as Serious Sam, Planet Badass. With it comes many new features, like a more open level design, multiple vehicles, a colourful European setting, a skill upgrade system, and a new system dubbed the Legion system that looked to introduce us to the prospect of fighting thousands upon thousands of enemies on screen at once. Now that the dust has settled and the game has received some very much needed patches to bring it up to a more complete and playable condition, let's try to cut through all the hyperbole and see what this game is actually like. Serious Sam 4 story and the events take place before the events of Serious Sam 3, with Sam on the hunt for the Holy Grail to stop Mental's forces from invading. The first few levels take place in Italy, where you run through the idyllic streets of Rome, with a quick stop off to Mount Vesuvius to set off the volcano, before heading back to Rome for a cheeky peruse through the Vatican. Then the latter half of the game has you roaming the French countryside and teaming up with the local French resistance as you battle to the location of the Grail. The final two levels take place in Russia as you make your way to the big showdown between the Earth Defense Force and the True antagonist of the game. The big addition here is that for the first time, Sam isn't doing this alone, and throughout the game he's accompanied by various NPC characters that range from a shotgun-wielding Russian priest to the most badass grandma I have ever seen. No, no, we'll open a can of a whoop -ass. You also get to spend more time with Sam's ill-fated crew from the third game, Rodriguez, Jones and Hellfire, who have all been given a makeover and a healthy personality injection here. I've heard some people say that they're a pointless addition and they really don't help out in combat much. Whilst I can agree on them not being too useful in most combat situations other than as a distraction, I personally didn't find their inclusion too offensive and I actually didn't mind the banter between them. One of my favourite characters has to be this big red scorpion alien who defected to the French resistance as an informant, who then joins you for a section where you absolutely plough through the ever-loving heck of a whole ton of enemies together. It's amazing. The jokes in this game actually landed for me quite a lot more than I was expecting, and I actually caught myself laughing out loud a few times, especially at this exchange. This looks awesome! What's it do? I believe the artifact was part of the Sreen's research into the properties of time, and may have a time dilution effect. So could I use it? In theory, but you must first return it for study. Or I could use it. Or you could bring it back. Or I could use it. Or you could bring it back. Or I could use it. Or you could bring it back. Or or I could bring it back. Or you could use it. Well, thank you, Professor. <laughs> ah, yes, gadgets. Yes, another contentious addition to the series amongst the community that I actually didn't have too much of a problem with here, in all honesty. In fact, I feel that they add more variety to the combat than anything else, especially with a few notable examples like the portable black hole and the Holosam, a not-so-subtle recreation of the Holoduke gadget from Duke Nukem 3D, but with the added benefit of it being able to move around by itself, making it infinitely more useful, especially against a kamikaze Horde. Just look at it. Fucking poetry. Speaking of Duke Nukem 3D, you even get a portable health kit and a rage serum that kind of reminded me of the steroids pickup from that game. Only here it's not only used to greatly increase your movement speed, but it also greatly increases your damage output and rate of fire too. Of course, all of these are completely optional and the game can still be completed without using any of them, but their inclusion is a welcome one nonetheless, and I happily used these a bunch of times during my first playthrough on hard. I would say that they could do with making it easier to select the right gadget under pressure without the weapon wheel. There have been multiple times where I've been too preoccupied with switching through gadgets to find the one that I actually wanted to use, only to end up either taking more damage or sometimes even being killed. 
which is not good. One way they could definitely improve this is by having the gadget assigned to a hotkey that you could press to instantly get the gadget that you need, and it would greatly improve the flow of the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay as a result. As it is right now, it's perfectly usable, but it certainly feels more cumbersome than it really needs to be. No doubt this will be something that's addressed in a future patch, if not already, as listening and reacting to the player feedback is something that Crow Team are really good at. Something else that adds variety to the series is the new Sam skill upgrade system. Much like in Doom Eternal, you can use points that you find in certain chests to gain new abilities and powers. These range from having enemies drop health and armor when killed, faster reloading, faster movement when aiming down sights, upgrading your melee attacks, and the best perk of all, being able to dual wield every single weapon type in this game. And I do mean every single weapon when I say it, which often led to some extremely satisfying moments where I take out a large horde by pulling out not one, but two mini guns, holding down the fire button screaming like Rambo until everything had stopped moving. It's fantastic. But what's even better about the dual wielding mechanic is that you can fire each weapon independently, greatly increasing the control that you have over your own rate of fire. You can also unlock a perk that lets you dual wield two completely different weapons at once, meaning that you're only limited by your own imagination. You can have something practical like a machine gun and shotgun combo, or something slightly less practical like a cannon and a knife. And the game will let you do this if you really wanted to. There are some abilities that I really didn't use or see the point in personally, such as the perk that lets you pick up and throw road signs as weapons, or the one that lets you ride certain enemies like vehicles, but I'm honestly glad that these perks are here regardless for people to mess around with. They're still a really cool and fun addition to this game, but there are just so many better methods of taking down enemies that this game gives you without even needing to have them unlocked, so they're kind of not even worth spending the points on to begin with. You can chop and change skills as and when you need to via the game menu to try things out and see what fits your playstyle best, but I honestly feel that the left hand side of this skill tree is way more useful and beneficial to most serious sound players than the right will be. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that it would have been better having certain skills unlocked by default, but set to a contextual action the player can use in order to perform them at any time. Like stunning an enemy will cause them to enter a state where you can run up to them and then use a button to use the rodeo ability, but for a few seconds instead of it being tethered to a health bar. Or even having the ability to throw objects unlocked from the get-go allowing for more creative experimentation during combat. Make it a core feature for people to dick about with rather than an optional skill that's hidden away that more players will most likely ignore and never use. I'm actually genuinely curious to know how many people who played this game agree with me on this or not, so if you have any thoughts or comments about this then feel free to leave them below for me to check out. Basic combat hasn't changed much from Serious Sam 3. You run and shoot hordes of enemies and it generally doesn't matter where you hit them so long as you just did. Now in Serious Sam 4 they've added a critical damage point to a majority of enemies that allow for more skilled players to be rewarded for their accuracy. Usually this means shooting them in the head to deal more damage but sometimes you can perform a one shot kill if you have a certain weapon equipped. Enemies like the wereballs almost become trivial to deal with once you've mastered this technique with a double barreled shotgun, but the real fun begins when the witch brides show up. Thankfully they've been retooled from their annoying and unbalanced Serious Sam 3 counterparts and no longer hold you in midair, but instead they zip around the level and throw objects at you from afar, which is a far better use of them in my opinion. Now with the added critical hit system, these pests can be taken out by skilled players using the sniper rifle or devastator with a well aimed shot to the head. This small addition might seem like an unnecessary one, but after playing this game for some time now, I honestly think this small mechanic is the innovation the series has needed for a while. It actually made me rethink what enemies I needed to prioritize in certain encounters, and it actually made the aim down sight mechanic for the pistol and machine gun feel a lot more beneficial and justified here. Before, in Serious Sam 3, you'd aim down the sights of the gun, and you really weren't incentivized to do this often, as you really didn't gain any actual true tactical advantage over hip firing instead of just a slight zoom. Now, with the headshot mechanic, not only has this issue been remedied, but I found myself actually using it a lot to take out enemies in a much more efficient way. It actually made one of the more usually forgotten weapons in the game, like the pistol, one of the most useful weapons in the game because of this. Seriously, dual wielding pistols in this game makes them one of the best weapons to use because they have pinpoint accuracy, infinite ammo, and are deadly when rapid fired. Trust me, they're good. The weapons that you use in Sam 4 are pretty much par for the course with the series if you've ever played it before. You have a knife, pistol, two shotguns, a machine gun, minigun, rocket launcher, grenade launcher, railgun, C4, laser gun, and pirate ship cannon. Yes, a fucking pirate's ship cannon. But this game brings a couple new toys to play with. The first is the automatic shotgun that's akin to the AA-12s in real life, and the second is a rocket-propelled chainsaw launcher that homes in on targets, rips through multiple enemies, and is almost capable of clearing an entire room with one shot. 
and it's fucking amazing. It's perhaps my new favorite addition to the series and is so ridiculous that I'm honestly surprised it wasn't added to the series sooner. And this is coming from someone who's used a mod in Serious Sam that turns your rocket launcher into a portable Sephiroth gun. <laughs> you also get secondary fire modes for certain weapons like the single shotgun getting a grenade launcher attachment or the rocket launcher getting a multiple lock-on attachment with the ability to fire multiple rockets at once. But the best one is for the laser gun that gives you a giant continuous laser beam that can wipe out most enemies in seconds and at almost any range. It's incredible. Remember the Syrian power gun from the next encounter and how that worked? Yeah, it's essentially the same thing here too, and it's nice to see it adapted into the series as a weapon attachment. I also noticed that one of the boss enemies that you fight at the beginning is very reminiscent of a boss monster that someone created for a mod for the first encounter HD that never got finished. Now, I can't confirm if this same idea was adapted by Crow Team after seeing this mod, but I honestly wouldn't be surprised to learn that this was true, especially considering that the modder now works for them. Speaking of the enemies, most of the series staples are here, including a few new ones to mix things up a bit. You've got these TF2 pyro looking dudes who fly around the place and firebomb you from a large distance, which was very annoying. These vampire looking dudes who fire ghosts at you and can randomly try to bite you. And space mummies who are mummies. From space. Yes. But ultimately, if you've ever played a Serious Sam game before, you'll recognize a lot of the enemies here, and there are enough new additions to keep things interesting, thankfully. One thing that I am very grateful for is the Scorpions no longer being hit-scanning enemies, and now their guns have physical projectiles that make them way easier to avoid and less punishing to deal with. Vehicles have also made a return to the series for the first time since Serious Sam 2 and the next encounter. You've got a motorbike, a farmer's tractor, a quad bike, and a combine harvester, which is just hilarious to use. And each of these you can drive around and fire from independently, which is good for allowing you to perform your own alien drive-bys, or for shooting off enemies that try to climb your vehicle when using it like the harvester. But the one that gave me the biggest smile on my face whilst using it, and the best addition to the series so far, was the giant battle mech called the Pope Mobile. This thing was so over-the-top ridiculous with infinite rockets, bullets, and a ground bombing attack to clear away nearby enemies that it was just amazing. I honestly cannot wait to see how modders use these things in custom levels. It's going to be incredible stuff. Speaking of levels, the levels in this game are a big step up from the previous game. Right from the beginning, you get a more open and interesting form of level design that suits the series well and plays to its strengths. What I also liked were the inclusion of optional missions that encourage you to trail off the main path to explore for more exclusive goodies. Some are as simple as reaching a location to collect an item, whilst others are more creative like one that has you fighting to rescue a princess at the top of a castle. Ha! Huh, a princess in a castle. How stereotypical. Hello! I am trapped in the tower! I could really use your help up here! As the game goes on, these levels get bigger and grander in scope, especially with the massive breakfast in France level, and whilst there's potential for more improvements to be made to this game in the future, there's just no denying how impressive this game can look at times. The brighter and less muted colour palette certainly helps to bring these locations to life and more in line with the more colourful and revered second encounter. While there are still some duds here and there, like the oil rig level in Russia feeling incredibly underbaked and there really not being a whole lot to find when exploring the breakfast in France level, especially when considering how big the level is, the rest of the levels are pretty fun and enjoyable to play. The last level where you're fighting through hordes of increasingly insane opponents and then charging at the final boss with what seems like all of Earth's forces during the Legion system set piece was especially a big highlight. I do wish that one day we return to the more zany and fantastical level design of the second encounter and first encounter, and that Crow Team doesn't keep making more prequels, but I feel that this game is a nice compromise between parts of the community that really enjoyed the third encounter's art direction and people that really enjoyed the classics. The last thing I wanted to touch upon is the game's sound design, as they've really done a good job in this department here. Each gun has a beautiful punchy sound to them that makes them such a joy to use. All the enemies have a unique and distinct audio cue to help pick them out clearly, and the music of this game has some great tracks to accompany the on-screen madness. Though it's not perfect as there are multiple levels that use the same tracks for both calm and combat states, which is a little disappointing considering the previous games all had unique compositions for each level, but they were still great to listen to. There were also several times where I'd just finish an intense battle clearing a room full of bad guys and then suddenly have the super dramatic music just stop dead and leave me in total silence for just no reason. I'm sure by the time this video goes out that they'd have patched this out already, but it certainly was a bit of a mood killer at times, let me tell you. The voice acting is about the level of quality that you'd expect from a game like this. John J. Dick is as great as he always is as Sam, though his line delivery for this particular one here is really bizarre. I sense evil presence 
Is your priestess tingling? I don't know why he says it like this. It sounds like he's straining his vocal cords or something. Tingling? The rest of the main cast were pretty good too. All of them had a huge level of camp cheese to their performances that made me feel like I was in a bad 90s action movie, which is exactly the tone the series should have. They even got Erica Lindbeck, the voice of Jesse from FF7 Remake, to voice Hellfire too, which was pretty cool. They also had a much needed redesign from the last game, which brings them way more in line with the game's current art direction. I really like the design of Sam in this game too, especially compared to his other modern iterations. And I'm really looking forward to seeing modders get their hands dirty with this game and create some really amazing stuff here. Just imagine how great it would be to see this game's mechanics ported into older titles like Serious Sam 3 or the HD ones. Or maybe with the addition of vehicles to play with, this will inspire modders to resurrect that next encounter HD project. But whatever may happen in the future, there's no denying that Serious Sam 4 is a really fun time. It might not have had the best start or be pushing the envelope like Doom was, but it doesn't need to. Serious Sam is still very good at what it does, and what it does is giving you a fuck ton of crazy enemies to shoot with some badass weapons to do so. Some people were expecting the Legion system to be more of a thing than it was, but I honestly feel that the way it's used in this game makes a lot of sense. Crow Team have always made games that are optimized to run on a whole bunch of systems no matter how high end or low end they are. So the fact they've reserved this Legion system for a giant set piece for visual effect at the end rather than having you fight 10,000 enemies on screen at once at several different points makes sense. I get why people might be disappointed because of what certain trailers showed us and who knows maybe they add this into one of the levels in a future patch but I honestly think it's fine the way it is. If you're already a fan of the series you've no doubt already bought this game and suffered through all the performance issues like I have but after just a few weeks Crow Team have worked hard to fix the multitude of technical issues that have plagued this game and bring it to a more complete and finished state. Now I can say with confidence that this is a good game and something that I can recommend to people looking to get into the series or are just looking to play another unique shooter. If you want something that you can easily pick up and play for an afternoon to blow off some steam and help take your mind off of all the shit that's going on in the world right now, then this game will scratch that itch. I mean, you could do much worse. You could be playing this piece of shit.